talking while I actually I can stay on for a couple of more minutes until I have to leave. But I was just telling everyone about the struggle that you are having to get online. Oh, I'm good now. You just gave me the different, you, you, you gave me Marcy family and every month I forget the, the how to get on. So I'm good. <clears throat> so as I stepped in, I, I was hearing that people were talking about some challenges that are happening with programming and online. And um, I feel like kind of the purpose of our meeting we didn't create a big agenda because we anticipated families would come on having questions about um the next phase of what we're going into with some online learning so um yeah if you have questions so, let's open yeah up the let's have an open discussion and we'll tell you as much as we know and as little as we know <clears throat> questions Go right ahead, Sonia. Thanks, I know this is a little specific to my situation, but you know, my kid receives homebound services and I was texting with the SLP who is at Mercy and then at Winona who serves us, Jessica Hamilton um, today. Fantastic, man, she is good. But <clears throat> that aside, um, she says that district policy is that um, they can't come and do our home visits. And I was just wondering, um, like she's supposed to come here for an hour tomorrow, but um, she we're we're planning to meet like via Teams. To, will she have to do it online? Is that yeah? But my, but he can thing? attend the online programming, and it's it's in his IEP. And I'm not asking for I'm not asking you no, folks no, no. to do anything about it for tomorrow. I just don't know what's on people's radars right now because everything I imagine is so chaotic with all the de details and nuances. So yeah. To DECA, she's the director of special ed because special ed's had some questions around this, around their transportation and whether or not the um, the bus aides ride the buses, even if there are not kids on the bus, because none of us know exactly how many students will show up at school. And it was stated in our principal meeting that special ed buses will run as usual. So I told my SEAs, my special ed bus rider people, that they should expect a bus to come and if it doesn't come to call transportation. So that's like a side thing, but special ed does have some of these situations. I'm sure Jessica heard from someone authoritarian in her realm, but I will also reach out to DECA and I'll shoot you an email if I hear anything different. Okay, Sonia? Okay. Thank you. <clears throat> you know, in a document that we received, it did say that all homebound activities are shifting to 100% virtual while we're going through this right now, but um, maybe we'll get some more clarification on that from DECA. Yeah. Did everybody just... understand the email? <laughs> it was a long okay. one. Is there anything you can think of that families can do to be supporting you all and staff? Well, our district is really complex in the fact that we are allowing our students who really need to come to school to come to school. And my feeling is that that situation is reserved for like the parents who have to work and their kids can't be left alone because what we're going to do here at school is have them online so it's going to be kind of a drag for kids to come now some of our older kids might think woohoo i get to come and there's hardly any people and it's going to be a party well it's not going to be a party and they're going to find that out really quickly but there really isn't there isn't anything anyone can do and thank you so much for the kind outreach all of us are getting a little edgy i think myself included, just like, oh my goodness gracious. But um, it's what it is right now. So I honestly, a family reached out and sent our staff a gift certificate for that, the cookie cart. And I haven't 
I haven't gotten the cookies yet, but what a nice, they just said, you know, thanks for the two teachers that have our kids and all of you, blah, blah, blah. I mean, those kinds of things make a difference. If you send them an email and say, thanks for whatever you do, that's fine. But yes, everyone is really like frustrated because we know we're not doing our best for our students. So they're trying their hardest to do their best. And, and this kind of learning is gonna be a little different than it was in the spring. The teachers are required to be with their kids basically the whole time. Now they might have uh, seesaw time in their schedule, but the teacher will be available if a child has a question during the day. It's gonna be like real school, not just hit or miss. And each team is figuring out their schedule. So if you have a third grader and a fifth grader, make them tell you what their schedules will be or the teachers will send them to you. So it's still, this meeting came at a kind of early time because we don't know what it's gonna look like. After Tuesday, we'll know a lot more. Yeah, Abra. So regarding the schedules, one of the things I'm slightly concerned about because I have two children at the school is that they'll be scheduled in such a way that they don't have an overlapping lunch recess time, which would make it a very big challenge for one parent to do lunch at one time for one and lunch a different time for the other and be making lunch for one while supervising the other's meeting. Like it's just not like some, some unified schedule for the break lunch time in the middle of the day would definitely help families instead of, it's kind of the opposite of in-person school where you want to actually stagger it out more it's useful to put it together for us. Yeah, I appreciate that comment. Trinity, did you wanna answer this one? Yeah, we have created a document um, that all of the teachers are going to put their online schedule on um, so that we can look at all of them just on one document together to see where we can find that common time to, to place it so that, you know, um, hopefully we're able to find one or at least one for K2 versus 3-5 or something like that so that we can have some of those common times. The tricky thing is our specialists, our centers teachers, are also required to teach live the same way classroom teachers are. So those scheduled times are supposed to stay the same so that kids can log into their music class or their theater class so yes, we're, we're gonna be doing a whole lot of finagling and trying to piece bits together tomorrow as teachers are getting all of their plans and their ideas together. And tomorrow we do have a morning meeting all at the same time and a lunch at the same time, right Trinity? Correct, morning meetings at 10 o'clock and lunch is at 12.30. For everybody. For everybody. Yes, Emmy. Um. So may, maybe this will change, but kindergarten, we got an email saying that we're not going to have any live sessions, no Google meets, no morning meeting or anything. Well, um, that is, that's not accurate information. I know probably okay. I'm hoping that that's, they sent that just about tomorrow and not moving forward next week. Cause we told our staff that they could have a little bit of flexibility tomorrow as they're trying to plan and get everything together. But um, we'll be having a staff meeting with everybody in the morning, just really clarifying all of the expectations. Um, receiving an email like that and not having a chance yet to talk to the staff, people are building their own assumptions and their own thoughts around what we're all supposed to be doing. So we'll have a chance to address that tomorrow morning. Sounds good. Thank you. That, and that won't be the case, according to what the district people are telling us. Teachers need to be available the whole day. So they'll be sad if they don't like our plan, but that's the way the mob flops. <laughs> you know what? Teachers are so interesting because they start planning right away before we even have all the information they have. <laughs> they are telling us what they're going to do. And we're like, uh, slow your roll because there's so much anxiety. There's anxiety about what's going to happen and who's going to show up and how is this going to work? Blah, blah, blah. Yeah, they're a tough crowd to please. So we've we haven't had our staff meeting and that'll be tomorrow morning. Mostly because the superintendent didn't talk to us till this morning. Uh, Taylor and then Claire. Claire had her hand first. You can go first, Claire. Okay, thank you, Claire. Go ahead, I mean, thank you, Taylor. Thanks. 
Um, so I guess what I'm a little concerned about is in your email, you said screen time would be uh, developmentally appropriate, but now it also kind of sounds like the kids are going to be on the screen or iPad or computer or whatever all day long. What, what are we, what are we looking at uh, for, for that? Cause not sure that's doable for, for families. Right. <laughs> I can, I can speak a little bit to that if you want me to, Donna. Yeah, please. It's going to look really different for our kindergartners versus our fifth graders. When they say that um, teachers are going to be live and available, that doesn't mean they're going to be providing live instruction the entire day. That means that maybe they're going to do a live launch and then the kids go on Seesaw and do an activity and the teachers available in a meet or available to respond to kids as they're working on Seesaw. It doesn't mean that we're expecting everyone to be right there in front of um, the, the screen all day long. We're asking teachers, especially for our little ones, to build in breaks, um, all different sorts of things. So really, it's going to vary grade by grade depending on the students' needs. But their centers will be live? Portions of it, for sure. I mean, they're going to greet the kids when they go to center's class and say, hi, welcome to music, and chat with them for a few minutes, and then maybe send them to a link to do an activity and then come back together at the end. Or, you know, it's good. that can also vary depending on the center's teacher. Okay. I'm just, I'm just trying to think, you know, for families to kind of keep track of all those different schedules, like when kids need to log into different things to join live things if they're not staying live all day. Um, and I know, I'm sure you've both already thought about this and seen how that's unsustainable and you're just kind of working with what the district is giving you. Yeah. But, um, yeah, I it's think a lot. it'll be considered tomorrow as they're making their schedules based on what we're supposed to do because, uh, um, and then it's also you as a parent making your choices about how long your kid's going to be online. I don't mean to be disrespectful or anything, but if you feel like your kid needs more breaks than that schedule allows, then that's what you should do for your kid. Uh, the district is telling us we have to be teaching as if it's real school, just online. So that's a long day um, with lunch and a recess and all, you know, that kind of break time. But it's longer than it used to be. So you know what your kid can handle and you know, no one's gonna ding anybody because they're not online all, you know, all the time. <clears throat> uh, Abra again. I oh, know, Taylor, you didn't ask. Thanks. Um, so disclosure, I'm, I, I'm a high school teacher in the district. So I'm one of oh, those hard uh, <laughs> people. Um, and I'll try, I'll try to separate my position there is my position as a parent. Um, but it, as you know, we are expected to be teaching alone in our classrooms for whatever reason. Um, and so <clears throat> having a kindergartner, um, I am really not convinced that the right thing to do is to send her to do online learning in the school. Um, being, it seems like that would be very difficult for her to navigate herself as a five-year-old. Um, and so that puts me in the position of, I, I'm gonna have to stay home and potentially take sick days to help her navigate her, um, her classes. And so I guess I'm just looking for like, <laughs> I guess I'm looking for a, uh, any sort of hope that like that's a good situation, but I, I don't think that I sense that. And so I, I just, I guess I'm curious, like what it's going to look like for the kids who um, do online learning in the, in the building. Wow. So mm -hmm. I'm sorry for that. I mean, we have some staff members who have children who go to our school or a Minneapolis school, and we're making accommodations for them to bring their child to school because they could be online in your room with you, you know? And I don't know if your principal or your staff would let you do that, but that's what we're gonna do, um, just to make it a tiny bit easier for the teachers who have that situation that way. Um, but you're right, it isn't gonna be that beautiful here. It's not gonna be, because teachers are supposed to 
part of this is is wound up in or tied up in the whole idea that the, the union for sure doesn't want teachers doing both things, teaching online and in person. And last year when we did it, when we had the situation, the second grade team chose to do that. And when they, by Trinity, and when they chose to do that, it was great. I mean, they, that team loved how they taught second grade, but the majority of teachers are like, I don't wanna do both things. So now we're being told, okay, teachers can teach online in their rooms alone. And then because we don't wanna overburden them with more students and you know having to have that same responsibility. And then all the other kids who come, whoever comes are gonna be, well, for tomorrow, we're going to start in the cafeteria and then see how many kids really come and try to distance them all between the cafeteria, the gym, and the theater. Now, my hope is that they stay home because, I, I mean, I, maybe I shouldn't say that, but these little kids are going to be sitting in a spot and, and the assistant educators, the associate educators, can be supervising them because they're not going to be teaching them they're going to be supervising them while they're online with their teacher and i would prefer my kid to be able to get up and go to the bathroom whenever he or she wants to or do you know because if there's a large group we're going to have to treat it as if everybody's six feet apart and you know can only go to the bathroom when they you know all that all the rules that happen in a big place like this so i said to the kids there will be a few kids here, as I was saying goodbye to them over the PA, I was like, there will be some kids that come to school, but for the most part, you're gonna be at home. And hopefully the kids understand that it's not that we don't want them here. It's just that it's not gonna be fun. <clears throat> so I'm sorry, do you want me to call your principal and tell them that your daughter gets to come to school? No, I'm it's fine. We were told that we're not allowed to bring our kids to school. Um, I'm sorry. So, yeah. So yeah, I, I I just maybe if my kid was older, I could see, you know, maybe making that sacrifice. But it's very hard to uh, think of sending my kindergartner to to do that. So thank you, and I understand that I'm just being put in the same position that all families are being put into. But I, I don't see the need to for me to be in the classroom teaching alone in the room if I'm not being asked to supervise elsewhere or have other responsibilities but again i'll try to separate my my that teacher point of view Barbara, did you have another question Oh, yeah, just kind of a little bit of a clarification on what Donna was saying about um, absences versus presence in classes. And I was wondering kind of how attendance was going to be taken and... Did we just lose Donna? I, it looks like, she, well, I don't see her. She appears to have disappeared. Well, that's not great. <laughs> Anyways, like most parents, I assume that I'm going to have questions about how attendance is taken and uh, how grading, whether any grading is going to be done based on presence in meets or if it's just going to be completing assignments, because that's a that's that's a big difference for for uh, how much I have to enforce for my child. So, yeah, that might be a question for the teachers once they actually send out a plan. So do we have an over-under on whether it's actually going to only be two weeks? Hey, Taylor. <laughs> Oops. <laughs> Taylor, can I ask you a question as a teacher? Uh, yeah, the, the meeting is being recorded, so. Yeah, well, was careful. any of this, um, it, it, it sounds like everything's being planned ad hoc. Are there any like advanced plans that were handed down for a situation like this? I mean, clearly everyone after a year of distance learning last year and over the summer, there would have been some plan from the district, right? Or no? Is this all just being planned now? 
for what uh, they were to do. It, yeah, I know that it was, I like, I think a lot of teachers found out as parents before they found out as teachers. Um, and we actually informed my principal, like our teachers were found, like an email that probably shouldn't have got out was teachers were actually informed principals before principals had known. So yeah, it's very short notice. Gotcha. I have a question. I apologize, you guys. I, I got frozen and then I couldn't get on either three of my computers. So I apologize. I didn't mean to uh, leave you hanging there, Taylor. Go ahead, Sonia. Um, <clears throat> students who receive special education at Mercy, what, it, because I know that my child, there's no time. I mean, there's no time. There's no time for educators to make plans for general education, much less to try to plan individual programming for every disabled child or child with an IEP in the school. I mean, it's not a, an, that's not a reasonable expectation, but what, Donna, can you, do you know anything about how needs of students with IEPs are being handled if there's anything we can do, you all know by now that making sure that children who receive special education have visibility as, as you know, full students at the school is kind of my thing. And I, I just know that my kids team hasn't had any opportunity to come together or consult as a team around how we're gonna handle this for him. And my kids team is like so cohesive and good. So if my kids team is not, hasn't had the opportunity to do this. I can't imagine other teams are. And so, I mean, I just, what's happening with special education right now? Um, so the special ed teachers are teaching online to the kids who need it. And some may come right now, a large portion of those students are quarantined. So I have a week to think about a lot of them and worry, you know, as far as them receiving services. But while we were in the in the throes of the pandemic before, our kids' needs were getting met. Even our students who are in who I would consider our most needy ones, uh, who are our youngest ASD students, uh, in a variety of ways, mostly by the parent working with the teacher. A lot of parents put in so much time in online learning because they have to be there for their kids. And especially with our ASD or autism spectrum disorder kids, um, parents were hand in hand with those teachers. So this is to us a short amount of time. And I know that our teacher who is in the ASD program with the youngest kids is working collaboratively with those parents about how much each one of those kids can handle, what they can handle, if they're gonna go online, if they're gonna receive a packet of work, what, you know, it, it all becomes very individualized. So I love to kind of look at the individualized side, but the thing that's hard is to look at the general population side and know that there's so many variables right now. Um, a lot of parents are struggling and a lot of teachers are struggling big time about what's going to come next because nobody likes not knowing what's going to happen and we don't know how many kids are going to come tomorrow I yeah. don't think a ton of them are going to come but we'll so see in my household and Taylor I'm just like my heart is just going out to you right now because my uh partner was a metro transit bus driver and had to leave her career in order for us to be able to care for and, and try to meet the educational needs of our kid because there were no services that could be delivered. So we could do that, uh, like, frankly, because I have a Section 8 voucher, and so we could do it. But there are so many families whose parents don't have the option to just leave employment. And I just kind of from an equity standpoint, because we are the parents who can be here in this meeting right now, whatever that means for each of us, I just want to make sure if there's any families in our school who might fall through the cracks because they don't have a situation where they can somehow patch it together to have parents doing this type of <clears throat> work, like, can, can we, 
if there are families who really need support right now, can we make sure that we know who they are and figure out how to collectively get some support to them as part of our school community? Does that make sense? Whether it's kids receiving special education or not, but like, how can we know where the specific need is? Yeah, it's tricky. It's tricky because of data privacy. And so I can't share with you names of families in, in, in general. Um, uh, I was gonna suggest to Taylor, does, does, does your daughter have any, do you, have you guys met any other families who are at home? Maybe she could go to one of their houses for like that bubble experience or another kindergarten family. I mean, I try to patch things together too. We have provided tons of services and I do feel like it's tons um, of services and food and uh, equipment and things to those people who, first of all, they, they let us know. And then second of all, we know because they're not attending or there's a problem, we're on that. We call the families who are not showing up and say, okay, what's going on? What's, how can we help you? And the district is very good at supplying the necessary tools for school. But the need, I mean, I don't wanna make this into a depressing meeting, but the pandemic has really affected so many families in so many different ways in bigger, bigger, bigger situations than we can ever fix. Um, the, the, the children whose parents don't speak English well, we do have cultural liaisons who can support them, but not everybody or the families who, I had families calling me this week who are still believing that they're not sure about vaccines. They're just not sure they're afraid of them because they are afraid their kids are gonna die from the vaccine. And there are, there's that out there. I mean, it's very, very big. So I'm glad it's only two weeks because I felt like we were getting some momentum towards school before this all fell apart. And the kids are very resilient and they get in their rituals and routines pretty quickly. And I'm actually getting to know the 250 new kids that were new this year. So I know them by name and that's better. And I know their parents, but it's bigger than, I mean, I appreciate what you're saying, but I guess I would reach out to the people in my own, like if you have an email chain or a group of people from your kid's class, so you can just write out there or put it on parents press. I'm, you know, I mean, Taylor, I don't know, maybe you could put out there, I'm looking for a kindergarten spot for my daughter because somebody might be willing to do it because they're home. And I don't know how you feel about the bubble and the germs and the masks and the everything, but I always feel bad when people have to take days off because of this kind of situation. I don't have good answers. And I wish the kids could play and interact in school like they always do, but this is what it is for two weeks. And honestly, our attendance has been shocking. A week ago, Thursday, I would have said, oh, Marcy, we're, we're missing it. We're not getting it. Well, it's not that bad here. Boom. It's really bad here now. I had over 187 kids absent today. That's a lot of kids. And then about 16 staff. And then, oh goodness, somebody lost a relative in their family and we're all looking at her like, you're really not gonna come back to work <laughs> because we need every hand on deck. But um, yeah, it's pretty dire. And I think that online learning will help push maybe the Omicron virus part out of here a little bit. I don't know, what do I know? I know that I don't catch it, I'm happy. Happy. I am very happy. I think I've had so many germs in my life that they hug me because the kids still hug me, but they're like only up to my waist. So that's good. Um, you know, and I have my mask on, but oh, it's just really, it's very strange around here. And my job is to try to support the staff and keep them as upbeat as possible because that's all I can do. And they're all good teachers and they're all good on the teams and they're going to figure out their schedules that'll benefit your kids. But also I would write with direct feedback because yeah, I have a preschool class here too. So they're not going to, well, they're all quarantined right now too because four-year-olds are not good at wearing their masks. So um, yeah, it's not the best for the youngest students. 
let's think of something positive. Uh, there's a day off on Monday. <laughs> I'm just kidding. It's really hard to keep morale up in, when you're looking at this giant tsunami right in the face. And I appreciate all of what all of you do on behalf of your children, because you have to do what you have to do. It's just, there, is, there, there aren't a lot of options, you know, and I am, the, I am the stop sign lady this year. I stand outside and hold a stop sign up. And so I talk to more parents than usual. And um, yeah, there isn't anything to say except hi, we're gonna, we're gonna make it, we're gonna get through that. I mean, I'm running out of funny little phrases to say, but I know that it will get better. It's just that when I hear what, ha what happens to families when they, when they don't, when they're losing income, well, not losing, you're losing your sick days or whatever because of this. And it's just so unfortunate. So I've, I've, that's it. I don't have any good news to share other than I think Taylor should call his kindergarten friends or put it online and say, who's got a kid? <laughs> if you're feeling comfortable doing that. Because that's the one thing our staff and our, our families are very kind. It's just that in this situation, we can't figure out, none of us can fix it. So we will work hard at getting that, like that schedule idea that you had Abra, about, um, about everybody have the same lunch. And I know it makes perfect sense, but then when does that one hour of those special, the special, yeah, yeah. And if one doesn't do it, then the other one has to not do it and it has to be fair and all that stuff. So I don't know, we'll just have to wait and see. I can let you know on Tuesday afternoon how it turns out. Or we can well, just we allow for more asynchronous education and say, this is what works best for Marcy District. Maybe y'all should follow along and listen to educators. Yeah. The, the sad thing, Claire, is that it isn't the best. Not for all kids. The level of our students, the, the levels that they're coming in at, the academic levels demonstrated very clearly that a lot of kids did not reap the benefits of online or distance learning because they didn't have somebody home to watch them. Like Abra said, you know, I have two I have to watch. And she's actually watching them. I mean, a lot of kids were left home alone. A lot of them never went on, never, the whole time. No matter what we did, drove to their houses, brought them hot spots. That, it, it, it just didn't work out for them. And I'm trying to be as non-judgmental as possible because as a whole, the dream I would have is to get rid of this year and just start next year and everybody may be in the same grade. Because they, we, they, we need to learn our multiplication and how to use a computer and how to use a calculator and blah, blah, blah. And that's what's worrying me. So I just remind myself that it's not a race. And they'll catch up because they're very resilient kids. We appreciate everything that the staff is doing and that you're doing. I know everyone is exhausted. And um, even so, my kindergartner has come home every day saying school is awesome. So, That's so good. Um, I saw a batch of them bringing it. home penguins this, this afternoon. A, a, a group of kids in art class of kindergartners were walking out with varieties of penguins that they had made. And I was just like, oh, thank goodness. They don't even notice. They don't even know what we're all fretting about. You know, they're just like, hi, Principal Donna. And then I just melt every time. So it's all good. <clears throat> Donna, you want a nice story? You want a good story about Marcy? I love good stories about our school. I love to share this story. So my kid is supposed to have this in-home education and there's no teachers, right? Yes. And he's real specialized, great big IEP, all these goals, super, super specialized. So who at Marcy can come to my house and try to do a little of these hours, but Mira, the media specialist, who yes. has no background in special education, no autism specialization, no specialization with IEPs. And she comes and she says, I don't know. I'm the one who could be here. Let's try to make it work. And she sits down with my six-year-old who can't talk, 
has almost no communication, needs help for everything. And the two of them, on their two hours a week that she gets to come and hang out in my living room, are finding the coolest, coolest, most meaningful educational services just by giving them some space and saying, I trust you two to work. I mean, I'm here in my house, but I just go in the next room and I'm like, you let me know if you need anything. And they are really finding their way. So like, cheers to the teachers who are like, I, this is not where I was trained to be or what I necessarily signed up for, but I'm the one, I'm sure there's a million of these. I'm the one who could be there. It's, she's so special. We're so let her blessed know. to have her. Oh, I'm glad because she's very funny and very quirky. She rides a bike to school with a horse's head on the front and parks it right outside my window. And I think, uh oh, but no, it's all good. <laughs> it's a very artsy kind of thing. Yeah. Well, I hope you all hang in there as much as you possibly can. I think I saw a penguin floating by, didn't I? Mm -hmm. I think Taylor's child just showed a penguin. But um, yeah, if there's anything we can do for you, just shoot me an email. If you have a question, shoot me, an, you know, just ask and I will give you my most honest answer or direct you to somebody who knows. I mean, nobody knows. Our superintendent and his minions uh, are always saying to us, oh, you know, we're so thankful for your flexible leadership. And I'm like, well, what else are we going to do? We have to be flexible because we don't want your kids to get sick. <sighs> anyway. This is really a bummer of a meeting. Does anybody have anything else they want to talk about? That's what I thought. Well, as far as I'm concerned, we can either you can launch into your other one or take a break and come back or whatever you'd like to do. I, I've there have been so many late buses and I'm not whining, but I'm only whining a little, okay? So there's so many late buses and my darn AP has had to have COVID. So, I mean, she's been out. And then, um, <laughs> and so I stay here until about 5.30, six o'clock every day till everybody gets picked up. And then there are one or two kids who don't have a ride and the parent calls and says, oh yeah, I, I don't have a ride for them. So then I drive them home. And because we're a magnet school of the whole city, I get really grumpy when I go the opposite direction of my house. So that happens. And I was gonna go home before this meeting so I could be home, you know, for it, but no, there. I was waiting with two kids for their sister to pick them up until 20 to six. And I told Trinity, that's what's happening. You know, if you know anyone with, who needs a job, have them be a bus driver, because that's what's happening. That's why we don't have the buses we have. And if any of your kids are on 12 and 13, I'm so sorry, because they're, they don't have a bus driver every afternoon, every afternoon. And this one boy and I have bonded because his mom doesn't get out of work till 445. So then she just hangs with me. And we watch out the window for the car. But that's what we do every day. It's really, um, it's, I think our district people expect a lot. And I think that we're up for it and we can do it. But the fact that you guys at least care enough to come to these meetings and care about how the kids in the school are doing is really, it's kind of a nice thing for me to know that you're out there. Donna. As someone that lives in the neighborhood, I have no idea if like legally how this could ever happen, but if there are ever times where a kiddo needs to come to our house, like I could, you know, if there's a consistent child whose bus is just not coming and they have no way to get somewhere, if you would want to match me up with that parent to, they could walk home with Harriet and chill yeah. at our house until then, so. <laughs> Thank you so much. I appreciate it. Just the social worker and I are legally allowed in Trinity to drive right. home. Yeah, I was more thinking if you like give me like the, hey, you should talk to this parent and then we can become a parent pickup or assistant. Yeah, thank you so much. <laughs> no, no, we're okay. I mean, some schools have resorted to the schools that have only a principal and no AP, like a little bit smaller schools. I know they have parent volunteers in the cafeteria. But we're set up pretty well with staff. So we have lots of staff to cover that kind of stuff. Even when half of them are out sick, we can still manage because a lot of times a lot of the kids are out. 
it's just every situation. But no, just knowing you guys are out there, if we really need something, I would absolutely call any one of you and say, uh, Mike, would you come over here and do that? <laughs> because I know you would come and you would help. And I appreciate that more than you can even know. That's the thing that makes this school special. Nothing, I mean, nothing else besides like the artsy fartsy stuff and it's all good. And the special ed stuff is excellent at this school for the most part. Um, I think that what makes it special are the people that are committed to being in this environment and you're hanging in there with us as we go through this really odd year. So, all right, I'm done talking. You guys have fun at Parent Connections. I'm driving home now, okay? If you have any questions, feel free to let me know. Take care. Bye, you guys. Thanks. Thanks, Donna. You're welcome. <clears throat> so we have some guests joining us with family connections, but they weren't going to come until 7.15. So um we could just hit pause should, we, should we go through our other stuff first so that we're all done with that and then see what time it is is that okay with other people i'm seeing some maybe some heads and nods and a thumbs up okay okay let's do it i will put the agenda in the chat Um, all right, so, um, I kind of feel like everyone is feeling like, Ugh, right now, um, or maybe that's just me kind of projecting that onto everyone else. Um, are people feeling like, Yes, it would be helpful to do a round of introductions and a check-in or skip it. So yes, thumbs up for introductions. Okay, I'm seeing several thumbs up with introductions. Okay, perfect. So let's introduce, if you can share um, names, pronouns, and then um, grades that your kiddos might be in at Marcy. And then if you can, jump to the next um, person um, on the screen so we can do it that way. My name is Claire Trolley. I use she, her pronouns. I have a first grader at Marcy in Nicole's class and I have two younger ones at home. Um, and I am going to send it to Sonia because she's next to me on my computer. Hey y'all, I'm Sonia. I use any pronouns. I have a kindergartner at Marcy who receives homebound instruction, y'all know. Um, and I will go over to Abra. Hi, I'm Abra. I have a second grader, Thea, and a fifth grader, Cassius. And next to me on my screen is Emmy. Hi, I'm Emmy. I use she, her pronouns. Uh, my daughter, Leora, is in kindergarten in Leah's class, and I also have a three-year-old. And Taylor, if it weren't for the unvaccinated three-year-old, I'd take your kindergartner, but we're kind of keeping tight wraps. So, <laughs> uh, Taylor, I'll pass it to you. <laughs> oh, no worries, but thanks. <laughs> um, hey, I'm, I'm Taylor. Uh, I have a kindergartner in Miss Joy's class and I will popcorn to Rebecca. Hello, I'm Rebecca. I go by she, she, her. I um, have, sorry, I'm trying to think through my children. I have only two. One is a fourth grader with Melissa. Um, and then I have a seventh grader who went to Marcy. Um, no, no longer there. And let's see, Mike, how about you next? Hi, I'm Mike. I have a second grader, Emmett, who's in Andrea's class. Um, who hasn't gone yet? I'll send it to Laura. Um, hi, I'm Laura. I use she, her, and um, my son, Leo, is a kindergartner in Stacy's class. Uh, does anyone else need to go? 
I'll go. I know it doesn't say my name, so that's confusing. Uh, I'm Kate. I have two kiddos at Marcy. I have a kindergartner, Milo, who's in Stacy's class, and I have a third grader, Oliver, who is in Katie's slash Megan's class, since Katie's going to have a baby any day soon. Um, I use she, her pronouns. And Emmy, did you go yet? You did. Okay. I couldn't tell if you had your hand. Kevin, do you want to go? Sure. I am uh, Kevin. Uh, he, him, his pronouns, uh, fourth grader. And I think that was all the questions. Did Heather go? Heather is our... one. Oh, go ahead. No, you Heather, no, you Heather, Heather is one of our panelists that will be joining us in a little bit. Um, so um, we'll let her introduce um, herself when she is um, ready to present. Um, so we have just a couple of kind of boring business things that we need to, um, go through, uh, before we start our presentation a little bit later. Um, and then maybe we can have a little bit of a break before the presentation. Um, so first of all, um, if we need to approve the December meeting minutes. They are linked in the agenda that I put in the chat. I will put it in the chat again right now in case anyone missed it. Um, and you can click the link through to see the uh, December meeting minutes. Um, can I get someone to motion to approve? Or if you have any questions or concerns, please. Claire, is there any way, and I'm asking this understanding, I'm asking something of you and I hate to ask any anyone. Um, is there any way that the agenda in the previous meeting minutes could be emailed to me before the meetings? Just because of for accessibility, I use a small display and I can't click between um, uh, the, the document and the, the Zoom meeting. Yeah, absolutely. Can you um, share with me your email? And I can, yeah. um, I can do that. Uh, with months moving forward. Happy to do Thank that. Thank you. I so much appreciate it. I move to approve the December meeting minutes. I'll second it. Fabulous. Thank you. Um, and then there were a couple of things. We did get our final numbers back from the Chipotle fundraiser we did in December. Um, um, Kate, I don't know if you want to share that. And then there was also a Facebook request to talk about something too. Thank you so yeah. much. I see your email. Um, we made $156, not a ton, but you know, it's some money. <laughs> Every, every penny counts, as Sydney said. So, you know, it is what it is. We had some, we had some Chipotle. Chipotle was eaten. I looked forward to that night just to like not cook. So, hey. I know I did like early order ahead and then picked up for like three different families. And I think the people at Chipotle thought I was a little bit like <laughs> enthusiastic about Chipotle because it was like seven bags of Chipotle coming out the door. <laughs> Um, and Claire, you want to talk about the Facebook thing? Yeah, so there was um, a request or a suggestion on the Facebook um, page as to how we can be supportive of teachers, educators, staff at Marcy. Um, and we did kind of touch on that a little bit in the first part of the site council. Um, um, and I know I put out an email to um, our, our kids classroom teacher to see how um, we could be supportive. Um, and so I would like to just put it out here to see if anybody, if anybody has ideas or suggestions um, of how we can be supportive. And I think I would put it beyond just educators and, and staff at Marcy, but of families too, right? The only way we're gonna get through this 
is community connection and care. Um, and so um, if anyone has has ideas, I, I would love to to hear them. I will also put my email in the chat if um, anybody wants to connect or chat off offline. So I, I think that might have been me on Facebook <laughs> who suggested it. But yeah, I honestly don't know what I can do to, for example, help Andrea in her second grade class right now. Like I'm, I'm kind of out of ideas. So yeah, it might be a really good idea to reach out to the teachers themselves and say, what do you want? What do you need? A couple of years ago, we did do that. Um, tar it was like a target wish list that teachers and AEs could like add in things that they wanted. And then we could all click on that link that was in Parents Press, and then we could purchase them and they'd get shipped directly to the school. It was kind of nice because I always do like I just emailed Harriet's teacher and she had needed glue sticks and tissues. So Harriet came with a garbage bag full of tissue boxes the other day to school. But it's like that's an easy buy, right? So I could have actually bought that for a few other classrooms if I had known that someone else needed them too. So I love when I could see what, you know, what classrooms, what grade grades need it. Cause then I could help like all the fourth grade teachers or so anyway, I've liked that in the past when they've had it. I don't know who set that up, if that was something Sydney did, but it was nice. But the hard thing is sometimes some teachers will put a lot on there and then some teachers won't put anything, but at least we see a few things that are needed. That's a great idea. I can, I can ask Sydney if she did that, or if not, like maybe, I, I mean, we could certainly set it up and then I don't just a one, I assume one person has to like add the items, huh? I am assuming yes, I guess. Yeah. I, I don't know how it worked. And the hard Abra thing, I'm knows. not sure too, I like, like with, Abra knows. <laughs> when, when things got returned. Oh yeah, sorry, go ahead. I no, think it was Abra knows everything. <laughs> unrelated, I do not know the answer to that question. Although there are some, some various school wish lists where teachers are able to put their wish lists up. So it might've been one of those. Um, but I was thinking specifically of ways that we can help teachers and families during the time that we're remote. And if the teachers actually think about ways that a parent could volunteer online, um, some like in what way can we do that? And how can their online class benefit from that kind of thing like whether it's a story time or whether it's a hey i could really use it if somebody would run one of those little online game thingies for the family or something else like that or if it's hey i could use somebody to run errands and drop off paper craft kits at 20 kids houses you know something along those lines you know things that we could do without being in person or having to yeah, but things to to foster that connection kind of, I guess, is the question that has to be something that teachers know is an option before they think about asking for it, if that makes sense. But I know that ha getting mail specific, getting getting like little packets from school was one of the most exciting things for my kids during distance learning is they like we have a special project and you've got a special little drop off that you can do a craft kit that you can do with the family, you know, you can do with the whole class, that kind of thing. Taylor, can I put you on the spot for a minute? Yeah, I stepped away, so I have no idea what happened. In so the last we're talking time. about what we can do to help support educators and staff and families right now in the Marcy community. And I'm wondering, as a uh, MPS teacher, is there something that you wish your um, students families or, or school could be doing to to support you um, in a way that that we could support other educators and staff or families and if you say Claire don't do that to me this is being recorded I can't answer that that's okay you you can just say uh no not right now because I'm um, totally putting you on the spot I think it's it's like we can't solve the bigger problems that are the root of um why we're all where we're at. 
Um, I mean, it's obviously like, it's definitely like nice gestures as I think people were discussing in this meeting and I've seen um, in other groups, parents talk about, you know, getting teachers gift cards or, or whatever. I'm, I don't know, <clears throat> I, I'm always like, uh, I'm, I'm never good at accepting things like that, but obviously like those are, those are nice gestures. Um, I think for something that I keep in mind um, for my students, and I, I think just a good thing to keep in mind for everybody is just like keeping, just like giving grace and, and not putting pressure on people to perform like these are, are normal times because they're not. Um, so yeah, I, I don't know how like, like a gift card is not gonna solve uh, what, what everybody's experiencing, but um, it's definitely a nice gesture. And I just like the, the communication and, and the, the, the talking to teachers and being willing to help and maybe, maybe teachers in, in your, your children's teachers could be more specific about their needs. I'm a little different because I teach um, high school students. And so maybe if you reach out to a kindergarten or a third grade teacher, they might be able to tell you exactly what they need. I'm wondering if there's some um, if there's some sort of like Google form or something that we can put together to help like connect families like, hey, I have the spoons to help with and then we could have like a list of different options. And then you or you could put this in as, hey, I'm someone who could use some help. And then they could click like, I could use, you know, a meal getting dropped off. I could use, you know, connection with getting potted up to help with um, online learning, not distance learning um, or whatever. But maybe we could come up with a list and um, kind of like email it out to, to, the, to the Marcy community. Um, you know, maybe we could see if... Um, um, uh, you know, it could get translated into, into multiple languages, um, um, and, and something like that. And, and even if, um, like, Chol, the, uh, social worker or some of the other kind of staff know that we're, we're putting this together, um, maybe that's something, you know, that they could share with families who they know could help or, or could use some, some help. Um, but I'm wondering what, what people think about something like that, if we could put that and then we could kind of like match, match households up. I think that'd be great. I'm wondering if there's would be a, a way to somehow submit something anonymously if a family was, you know, not wanting to make all that information public about their specific needs and whatnot, but perhaps the What's the social worker's name, did you say? Chol is the social worker. Chol. Um, yeah, I mean, maybe there's a way to like, for them to be a conduit or, um, and families, or if they, right, like you said, they could tap, um, let families know who they think might benefit from, from that. Going off of that, Claire, I was just, I have no idea if this would be helpful in any way. Just as we're talking about it, it seems like it's very specific classroom to classroom, right? Like what the needs may be. I wonder if it's something we should communicate to teachers almost of like, personally, I have never met another parent from the classroom my kid is in this year, right? I've only met her teacher online. It would be kind of interesting if we did some sort of just this, but like a Zoom call for that class and with the teacher, and then they could brainstorm together as groups of like, hey, I have this specific need. Here's an issue that I'm seeing in the classroom. I wonder if we could encourage that and they could use this, this Zoom link if, I don't know, it's just one idea I had. I've never really met anyone, maybe that we could meet as groups that way and brainstorm more. I also think that the access barriers, like when you're a family who needs the help the most, and I'm speaking as a family who's been the family who needs a lot of help, um, the access barriers to get the help is the problem. Like you're gonna hit people who maybe could use a hand to get over a bump, but are not 
the families that, you know, might really literally be struggling to meet day-to-day needs because families who are struggling to meet day-to-day needs in that sort of like um, acute ongoing way don't have the energy to fill out a form and get it back. Like, it's just too much. It's not what you're thinking of. It's not, it doesn't actually pertain to your survival. So I'm thinking of like, gosh, I don't know. I'm just riffing here. It was helpful when, who was it who was just talking? Rebecca, when you said, because my question was going to be, as a kid who's homebound, who's never actually been to Marcy, uh, or the parent of a kid who's homebound, like, do you know the other families of the kids in your class? Like, who knows the families? Okay, do teachers know their kids' families? Like, is there a sense, not with any sort of, like, judgment, like, because I think put together grocery sacks that have granola bars and bananas and potato chips and lemonade in a can and send it to every student's house unless they opt out. You know what I mean? Do something like that. Like get the families who have the ability to say, we don't need this. We can pass on this. We're not hurting for these groceries that are non-perishable that our kid can literally grab out of a plastic grocery sack and have something to eat during the day because nobody has time to cook or prepare a meal. Like not because they're not excellent parents, but because like you don't have time, you don't have time or wherewithal to do it because you're juggling too many things pertaining to survival. So like I would try to get it to everybody who doesn't opt out and just like, I mean, bring food, bring food that you can eat out of a grocery bag because that's what we always needed the most. And like a gift card at Target for anyone who doesn't opt out, if we can throw like a $10 gift card in there or whatever. So let me ask some some clarifying questions, um, Sonia and Rebecca. Are you, first, Rebecca, are you kind of thinking that family connections like connect with like maybe grade level teachers, like all the fourth grade teachers or something like that to say like, how can we be of, of assistance? Um, I honestly was kind of thinking or, more specific each classroom, just because that way you might hear from others in that that are following that exact same schedule of like what's works, what's not working, what do other families need, what is the teacher specific to that class need for help. So that's where I was coming from with it. And I was also just thinking it might be a little get to know you. You know, right now we, it's been such a weird last two and a half years, right, of never getting to meet any other families. And so to have even a chance to see other parents' faces would be interesting. And then I think too, the teacher could in that you know, say like anyone that wants to share contact information, like I know we have the parent directory, but not many people are signed up for it, right? So if a teacher could actually say, hey, anyone that's on this call, do you want to be added to an email list together? And we could actually then have each other's emails. Some some teachers appear to have forgotten how BCC works and all their emails are CC. Gosh, how did that ever happen? That now I have all the emails <laughs> from all the parents of the kids' class. Shocking. <laughs> But I, I like the idea of parents meeting each other, and that might be something that a teacher could do during class time so that they can meet whoever the caregiver is who is there with the child at that time. Just a quick like, hey, grab your grown up and have them come over and say hi while you eat lunch or something like that would be a good connection, perhaps. But that again would need to come from the teacher and not so much from the parent end. Yeah, and maybe maybe you know, parent con or family connections, the piece that we could do is have a facilitator on the call that could take notes and kind of help derive ideas of like, and, then, and even maybe find common things that are a problem classroom to classroom. I, I don't know, Claire, if that really would, would help. I was just trying to think through what, what could we do as the family connections part to those meetings. I, I love that idea. I mean, I love the idea of getting to meet, um, you know, other families in the class. I wonder how we could make it accessible to um, families who's, you know, for whom English isn't their first language um, or who are working during the day and, you know, the high schoolers with the younger students or whatnot. Um, maybe we can, yeah, brainstorm about something that, that feels accessible to the most number of families. Um, 
And then Sonia, I had a follow-up question for you. I, I love the idea of, of doing um, like a snack drop. Um, I'm wondering, do you know, um, I guess what, what I'm struggling with is how do we, how do we get that information? And maybe we don't get that information. Maybe instead what we do, because I think families are supposed to pick up food at Marcy, like if you're at home, which, which doesn't seem like totally accessible, but I, I guess I don't know how how to get that information to do, to do a drop. And we're supposed to pick up the food every day, is yes. that, which is a bigger problem for Marcy than it is for other schools that are neighborhood schools, because our students come from all over. Like for us, that would be a 40 minute drive, 20 minutes there and 20 minutes back daily, which is, you know, fortunately it's not a necessity for us, but if it was a once a week thing, or it would be so much easier. And as it is, we can't even do that at the beginning of the day because that's when the day is starting and we got to get the kids starting school. But it's just, yeah, it's not as accessible for Marcy because our students come from all over. I don't know the answer to um, the, like the, the food drop in terms of like nutrition provided by the district for um students who would be getting that those meals if they were in the building and who don't have a way to access them I have to think on that and I don't have the answer off the top of my head I do feel like to your point Claire it's really like it is not reasonable that we would gather information about every family and uh, every needs profile of every family with students at Marcy um, I think that we could guess that anyone who's having their kids come to the building in person during the next two weeks is probably dealing like juggling a few more plates than the average family. We can't know each individual circumstance, but if we wanna put together a non-perishable snack bag and put it in that kid's hand before they we send them home, we're gonna get some kids and if they don't need the food, they can throw it away. I would rather have people throw away bananas and granola bars in order to get, you know what I mean? So that's that's like a place to start that literally could be put into action for next week. I was going to jump into, you know, we we do have every meal that comes to our school and puts like food in backpacks on Fridays and they have a list of kids that are getting those on Fridays already at the school. So I wonder if that's something that we would be able to have access to, but that is a service that's already being offered on Fridays. And to the point of people who have to drive a really long distance to Marcy because they're coming in from all over the city. Um, I guess this is more of a is more of an issue with the actual district itself. But for the people who have to do that drive, if there was a possible way for them to, if they need have the food needs, and they're like that this school is actually closer to me, can I pick up my food from this school instead of going to Marcy, that would be a much more equitable thing. But I don't know who to contact or how to get that process going. I think that's a like that seems like a great solution, doesn't it? You know, and I know Marcy in when they had like oh, oh man, whatever that was, two and a half years ago when they had a bunch of food at the school, they weren't having people show up at all to get it. So they had a bunch of excess food. So it is interesting because I wonder if you could even I bet if you even just called the school in your neighborhood that you live closest to, I would imagine they wouldn't turn people away. But I don't really know that for sure. Y'all, these are some fabulous ideas and brainstorming. Um, I want to make sure that we have um, time to do kind of our, our planned presentation. Um, and so what, what I would like to do um, quick before we do that first is um, can we, uh, uh, Kate, correct me if I'm wrong, but can we do a vote to use some uh, parent council funds to be able to go down to Costco and get a whole bunch of different snacks um, so that we can put them in brown paper bags and drop them off at school um, by Tuesday so that you know kiddos that are coming in uh, person 
can leave with a bag of snacks or have a bag of snacks to eat while they're there during the day. Um, is that, is that something that we can vote to? I don't know. Um, yeah, I agree, Alice. I was totally going to go to the Costco business center. Um, but, um, to run there and I don't know, like we could get a ton of food for 50 bucks or a hundred bucks or something. Is that something that, that we can do? Yeah. I mean, I think we can just put it under Rebecca. I'm looking at you too, cause you have more experience at this than me, but like, I, I, I don't remember. Just... I don't know what your approved budget is this year. I didn't see it. Um, but I think like this could, we could put it under under like events too i'm assuming that's i was going to say parent events we have, mm -hmm. yeah because we're not really doing any right. parent events so yeah. this, this could be i mean parents are coming to pick it up right. it's a moment to be able to do an exchange and handoff the only thing I, I still clear i would double check to see if if every meal is what it's called now but it was shared in story if shared in story may already be having stuff next week that they're giving in addition so i would just make sure we're not getting i mean if it's non-perishable who cares not if there's in excess but i just thought Maybe you might want to see what's going to already be at the school that they're planning to hand out. I'll follow up with um, Donna and Trinity okay. to see the best way to to work that through. But yeah, also like I love your idea of even snacks for kids that are at the school during the day too. And kids who are in Sheridan's thing who aren't in school and therefore aren't getting that bag of groceries in their backpack, like do they have another way to distribute it to them? I mean... That's my thought is that if you have kids taking it, not that they shouldn't get it during the day when they're there, I'm not gatekeeping that. But if you send kids home with a bag of some snacks, at least if there's not availability of someone to make a dinner that night, there's some quick grab and go options. Like families can patch it through for dinner with some of that stuff. If there's other kids in the house, like it's better than not having anything easily available. And like sometimes when you're a parent and you're trying to patch all this stuff through, like kids get granola bars for dinner and like it's actually totally fine so you know what I mean right I, I will follow up I will follow up with that and um see see what <clears throat> what can be done and the things to go but I don't want to put Claire, Claire, our, do you, oh, you want to like just do a like tentative uh vote to approve that in case we want to spend that money because it's not happening with Sheridan story um Kate, if you're keeping it in that parent events, you don't need to. Then we don't care. Okay. No, it's approved already. All right. Okay. Rebecca, I love you. <laughs> All right. We have some fabulous guest panelists here joining us this evening to talk about school choice. And we have some parents who are here to talk about um sending their kiddos to Franklin Middle School um as well as northeast middle school so if your kiddos are interested in the um kind of art steam process franklin is kind of the pathway that way and while we are a citywide um magnet school northeast is the local um middle school here closest to marcy um, but before we hear from the parents, we have Heather Anderson with Advancing Equity Coalition um, to give us some information and maybe reframe how we think about things with school choice um, and everything else. And so with that, Heather, I would like to pass this off to you with our thanks for being here. Thanks, everyone. Um... I'm so honored to be here and I can't believe we have to do distance learning again or now it's rebranded as online learning so it's totally going to be a better experience anyway um so I just want to thank you all so much for being here um so my name is Heather I am a white parent to two students of color and um, we moved to the city when my children were entering into third grade because we wanted them to be able to have more racial mirrors in their life. So I always tell people that we're one of the um, families that moved to the city for the schools instead of the other way around. Um, and we uh, were at Lindale Community School, which uh, is a global majority school, and my children entered there into third grade. And um, from the, from outside looking in, I think we really knew what our children needed and wanted and uh, what was best for them. And we'd read a lot of 
blogs about adoptees um, needing to have racial mirrors in their lives. But I will say that from the minute we chose this school that was full of kiddos that, you know, didn't look like what I was used to and lots of different value systems and um, very different means than we were coming in from District 196, which had a lot of means. I, I did start to lay awake at three o'clock in the morning and worry um, about that. And um, I can just say that my time at Lindale was transformational for my children and myself. Um, I became an activist and um, in my time at Lindale and working to um, work with some Somali families who didn't want to be out of, out of Lindale, I met some amazing early integrators in Minneapolis who really sort of led the way and showed me all the ways to make friends and to stop using the word playdate and <laughs> to um, have uh, birthday parties look a little bit different and, and a lot of those kinds of things that I didn't know how to do at first. And so um, I'm so thankful for that time. I now work as the community organizer for the Advancing Equity Coalition. I'm just gonna share a few things about our organization uh, for all of you real quickly. I won't do a whole slide presentation, but it's so much easier if I do it this way. Um, so the Advancing Equity Coalition, we exist because we believe that every child in Minneapolis public schools should receive a high quality education. And we really hope to um, develop the political will. We think that there's a that um, there's a lot of acknowledging of the systemic racism in Minneapolis, but there's not a lot of will to do anything about it. And then the organizational values that we operate from are racial equity accountability through relationships. We believe in cross-racial organizing, and so we do deep work in global majority schools, and we do deep work in um, white and or privileged schools, and we do work in schools like Marcy, right? We're developing relationships with parents all across the city. Um, we believe in the value of combining data and stories to help people see the vastness of the problem, and also to see that impacts of systems affect people with faces and smiles and dreams. Um, and then we believe in raising consciousness on the broken conditions and that there's nothing inherently wrong with the families that our district continually disservices. We operate from the policy platform. So in other words, when we're trying to think about how we're gonna use our limited capacity, we talk a lot about resource and opportunity hoarding in white wealthy communities. Uh, irrelevant curriculum and instruction. We believe that in a systemically racist system, race neutral policies are racist because they help us default into or stay in the racism and that we believe that they need to be actually like a little bit pro black kid, pro indigenous kids, uh, pro Hispanic kids, um, more inclusive for children with, uh, with needs. And so um, we believe that there's a true lack of accountability structure in Minneapolis public schools, and there's a real devaluing of BIPOC communities and their cultures. So that's just a little bit about us. The coalition members, uh, the organizations that are sort of the voting people of it um, are right here. You'll kind of see some folks, some different organizations that serve um, either communities of color or some foundations. Um, and so this group of people sort of really guides the work and kind of guides what we're um, looking to do and to create. And then um, my job is to inform parents of that work and to build relationships. And to um, I was just talking to a mom today and I was like, you belong talking at the school board meeting. That You can do that, that's your podium. They belong, they work for you. And she's like, I never thought of that before. And that's the part of my work that makes me that lights me up the most. Um, Cause I didn't used to think I belonged behind that podium. I almost threw up the first time I talked to the school board meeting. <laughs> and so, so anyway, this is just a little bit about our work. I'd invite you to um, check out our website, advancingequitycoalition.org, um, sign up for our emails and um, and be a part of, of change. I, I really believe that we're, we're building a group of parents who are deeply committed to seeing a system change fundamentally and um, and to be more inclusive. So I'm here tonight to talk a little bit about school choice and what makes a good school and what makes a bad school. And because I'm just edging out onto this side of the middle school experience, 
I made it. We're all alive. Um, I thought I would just share some of the lessons that um, I was grateful to learn about and some of the things that I wish I had done better. And um, so I know for myself, my middle school years were marked with trauma, not fitting in, being teased. And so when I began to think about my, and, and, and for me personally, those years in my life and my family life also sort of overlapped with a deep unraveling of my family unit, right? So not only did those years represent a deep, you know, emotional and physical change for myself, but then just like a real sense of identity and who our family was. Um, and so it was a real, it was really challenging for me. And um, I was the kid with the inhaler and the book. And so that tells you how my school experience was. <laughs> and so for me, when I started to think about my children going to middle school, it was really impossible for me to separate myself from that. Like I was carrying all of the fears of what if all of this happens to them when they go to middle school. And, and it was really starting to kind of cloud my thinking. And honestly, um, we were at two different middle schools. My children went to Justice Page um and then because of the cdd they did not have a spot for them at justice page and so they uh are at jefferson this year and i had a lot of anxiety about them moving for eighth grade right like that's a really tough year to move and all that honestly it's been great um jefferson's been an amazing school there were trade-offs justice page was a white or more white and or privileged school it was a great school there were trade-offs uh, each of those environments had trade-offs that were very different from each other. None of them had anything to do with the amount of black children who went to them or the amount of poor children who went to them, frankly. Um, it was literally just um, different climates and cultures, um, different principles, different paths, and some little bit of middle school. So um, I just was thinking, I was thinking about some of the things that I uh, Mama? that I <laughs> um, that I I wish I someone had told me earlier in middle school and that is that you know they are really magical years um, and their bodies and their minds are doing so much transforming at the same time and um, developmentally middle schoolers are learning that adults are human and can make mistakes and so that can create a lot of tension, especially if you're raising black children and they're learning that adults aren't perfect and um, not all te white teachers are comfortable having hard conversations with black children, um, especially black teens. And so um, for me, just really, it really helped me to remember like they're learning the skill. And so it's like in a magnifying glass because they're learning it. So I was corrected a lot and I just learned to be like, OK, I'm going to let that go because this is a skill they're learning. This is not about me personally, Heather. I do, in fact, know how to drive a car. I said that to myself a lot while I was driving. I do really know how to drive a car. I do know how to go to the bank. I do know how to wash my hands. I taught you all the things that you do to wash your hands. So thank you for telling me that I now am gross. But anyway, they are learning who they are. And so as they do that, they're going to go through lots of stages and different things and parts of them are going to come forward, um, style and hair. And I learned to just, um, there was a whole mm, three months where we wore the same bonnet to school, sleep bonnet to school. And I just learned that, um, okay, this does not reflect me any more on me any more than when they used to uh, throw tantrums at Target. This is another sort of a tantrum. Um, and then they are starting to define themselves as separate from the family unit, which is, um, you know, interesting and fun. And I learned to really take that as a sign of growth when they challenged our beliefs as a family instead of seeing it as a ch as like, oh, um, they don't value us. And I would hit, hit the panic button and uh, I would just be like, oh, our family doesn't really see it that way. Oh, I see it differently. And then let it go. The values are down there buried they're going to come back, <laughs> but just know that. And then I would also say like, uh, my kids really wanted autonomy. They wanted to be able to define themselves. And so as many places as I could, I let them define. And our amazing principal at our global majority um, school now, she said to me, middle schoolers just want to win a fight. 
So you should fight them really hard on something and then change your mind and just give them some easy wins. Like if you are thinking you might do it, say a hard no and let them fight you for it and be like, you have a good point, you win. And so I've followed that advice all this year and it's really been amazing. She's just like, you know, sometimes you just gotta give them a little bit of a fight because that's what they want and then give them a win because it's good for them. Like, you know what, you did convince me. So that would be like, those are my four things that I was thinking I would really wanted to have been taught uh, and thought about um, as my kids get to this age. And then I'll just say that um, as far as like choosing a school that was predominantly black, I would never ever go back, especially for a middle school. My children's school right now is like 92% black and Latina. Um, it's been great. It's been as great as Lindale. Um, we've had friends, we've, we've made, we've had people over. Uh, it's been different with the pandemic, but we're still making it work. And um, I have found it just as easy to get to know um, families cross-culturally as I did uh, when they were in third grade. A little different rules, but um, still making some great, amazing friends. And um, I think that when I look back on what my children gained from being in global majority schools, I think that they gained um, independence and a deep sense of owning what was their responsibility. Um, they have a lot of knowledge of how other cultures and uh, families and values interact with each other. Um, we did give up pork uh, for a whole year to try that, to honor our Muslim friends. Um, they now think that Sambusa is part of Turkey and on Colonist Day, Colonizer's Day. Um, and, um, and so uh, they, um, I, I think that there are many ways that my children learned um, independence. They learned that they can. They learned how to problem solve with each other. Um, they learned to have patience. And so, um, and they also, by the way, got high quality academic instruction. So um, I just would say like um, putting your kids in a school with children that don't look like them, uh, especially in middle school, I would just, my advice would be that you do not need to be afraid of it. It's, it's, it's gone well. They're still our kiddos. They still hold our values, even though they push against them sometimes. So that was, that's just what I wanted to share. I just wanted to encourage, and I'm, I'm always here for questions. Um, I always want to encourage other white and or privileged parents to think about the value system by which we make decisions and challenge it and hold it up to a litmus test and ask if it's really producing for us what we what we want. So thanks for listening. I can share next if that's helpful. Hi, um, I am Suzanne Vanden Hugenhoff, and I went through the whole middle school pr process just last year. I have a sixth grader. Um, he is white, like me. Um, I did not grow up in the United States. Maybe you can guess that by my last name, um, but I grew up in the Netherlands, and so I have no experience with schooling, um, but with schooling in the in the United States, I should say, up on starting in grad school, I have experience because I did that here. But um, everything, including bachelors, I did in the Netherlands, and so um, no experience. But my one thing is always, and this is where my husband and I sometimes have friction: public school all the way, because I believe that every kid needs it deserves a quality education. And really, I think the only way that works is by having public schools and having the majority of kids go to them. Um, so um, even with some of the disappointments we've gone through in the districts, um, I am adamant we're staying. Um, we are city people. So I am also saying we're staying in Minneapolis. Um, we're not, you know, taking the easy way out and going to Richfield or Edina, which is closer to where we are. Um, so my kids were um, at Lindale, um, like Heather's, a couple of years behind um, her twins. Um, and when um, last year the decision came for middle school, um, we um, just, we, at first we didn't do anything. It was just like, just a speech is our community school. He'll get in a spot there automatically. We don't have to do anything. It's nice and easy. Um, and then um, just like a couple of days before that first lottery, we got a postcard from Franklin. 
um, that said, hey, we have this new STEAM school and um, come look on our website and join an open house. And um, I had not really um, thought about magnet schools for middle school because before this academic year, there weren't really any unless you were in a K-8 magnet school. Um, and so we'd always been like just a page, but then I got that note card and I was like, oh, that's interesting because just a page is big and my kid is not. Um, and um, my kid loves both the STEM part, but also arts. And so I, I, I was like, this is great. Um, the fact that it is a um, majority black school was a pro for us because he came from Lindale, which is a global majority school as well. And so he was already used to that environment. Um, like Heather, I think that's where they learn a lot of skills outside of the academics. Um, and so um, we went to an open, first we watched the video on uh, the Franklin website. They have at least last year, I don't know if they still have it. They have this really cute video about their project-based learning and what the school looks like on the inside. And, um, and my kid was definitely intrigued, um, but still a little um, like, am I gonna really do this by myself without any of my friends? Um, one of his biggest worries was the bus because we walked to Lindale from kindergarten to fifth grade. We, he never took the school bus. And so, um, that was a new that was going to be a new thing for us and i could not help him through that because i had never been on a school bus um and neither had his dad because his dad also grew up in the netherlands um so you know we had some thingies then uh one saturday morning we drove um to the school um also my fourth grader um had to change schools because we are zoned out of lindell now so we drove over to look at hall and franklin at the same time could not go inside, of course, because this was in the middle of the pandemic, but just walking around outside, seeing that it is not that far, like it was a 10 minute drive. So like the bus will take a little bit longer, but it's not like the end of the world. Um, and we drove home and he said, OK, I want to go here. Um, and so um, so we did the second lottery and um, got a spot at Franklin and it has been amazing. Um, he is definitely in the minority as a white student, um, and but he is thriving. Um, one of the things that I really liked is that the teaching force there is very diverse as well. And so he has one white male teacher. Um, and that's the one white person that is teaching him right now. Um, and the rest are uh, people of color. Um, and I know this is a small thing, but I just think it's great for my student to see that um, that other people can be teachers too. Um, he did technology as an elective this first semester, and um, in a week and a half, when he starts the second semester, he will start theater, and he is just as excited about that as he is about doing the technology for the past semester, which the technology has been um, kind of gems and guys robotics. Um, and so um, so it's been tailored to his um, needs. He gets challenges by the teachers. His classrooms are small because it is a, um, a global majority school. And so there are not very many um, white families that are choosing it. Um, so his biggest classroom right now is 18 students. Um, and then there are classrooms that are smaller, like nine kids. Um, and so um, he gets a lot of attention and the teachers are really helping cultivate the community in um, school. Um, that's actually a hard thing for me because we were at Lindale, we were so close, we were helping all the time. And now they take the bus and I'm not there. Um, and so it's really all on, on him to, to make his friends and um, and build that community and he's doing really great. Um, we have to take his phone away at night because otherwise I'm sure he'd be on the phone with his friends all night long. Um, so at 8.30 he has to turn it in. <laughs> um, so it's been a really good experience and um, I would definitely encourage everyone to check it out, especially if your child um, has 
in, an interest in, in either um, STEM or the arts or both like mine. Um, it's really, uh, they're not forced into one specific track. They can, uh, they get to choose their electives um, at the beginning of the school year. And then they are placed in something for the second semester, but have the option to um, try and get another one. Um, and so it's really, uh, it's been a really great experience and um, happy to answer any questions if you have any. But otherwise, I'll, yeah, Alicia. Uh, my kid is really interested in the pool at Franklin. Uh, I don't know if they have, if they have a swim program or yeah. anything like that, but I don't know if they, that yeah. she was like, I want to go just because it has a pool. Yeah. So they actually do swimming in gym. Um, they have a three week um, swim course where they uh, where they swim every day. Um, and then I, I they might also have after school. Um, we don't at this point do after school because it doesn't work with my kids schedule. Um, this, so they might have an after school swim program as well. But yeah, they do a three week swim units um, during the school day. So, uh, yes, they definitely get to use it, but are not required to. So. If you're thinking, oh my God, my kid would die if they have to go into the pool, they do not have to, they're not required. I think I'm next for ch chatting about um, my family's experience. And we, my daughter is a sixth grader at Northeast Middle and um, I see some neighbors on here, so hi. <laughs> um, so on the surface, you know, when I was asked, you know, why my daughter attends Northeast Middle, I said, you know, she has good grades, she has friends, she's staying out of trouble. And, but then <clears throat> I really had to take a step back from that because um, honestly, there, there's a deeper reason behind it. And I wrote something, so I'm just gonna kind of read that. Um, <sighs> the reason my daughter is enrolled in Northeast Middle stems from our desire to be in a space and community that normalizes our diversity and doesn't tokenize it. My family has a variety of identities and not all of them are obvious. My daughter is middle class, has a white college educated parent, participates in sports, music lessons, and is healthy. My, my daughter also lives in a single parent household with a neurodivergent parent. She has an immigrant father with significant health issues. She is black and multiracial. She is neurodivergent and she is still learning who she is. I'm sharing this because I think very few families fit in to the status quo definition of a typical American family. We are all unique and I want our family to be part of a space and community that accepts this uniqueness. So just a global majority school makes sense to me. I don't think any school is perfect, but I value what a global majority school can provide more than anything that's letting my daughter be who she is. Oh, thank you, Heather. Thank you, Suzanne. Thank you, Reeve, so much for sharing um, these stories and these experiences and this information. We so appreciate it. Um, I have a couple prepared questions, but I want to open it first up um, for anyone else who, who might have, have questions for all three or, or just um, one person in, in particular. Okay, well, I will start asking questions and then maybe that'll get some juices flowing and other people will think of questions that they have too. Um, <clears throat> so my kiddo's not old enough yet for middle school. So this is a few years away for our family, um, but uh, certainly I have a very special place in my heart for all middle schoolers. I think it's a fantastic and fabulous age. Um, one question that I have and Heather or Suzanne or Reeve, any or all of you, um, this question is for, um, what is one um, non-academic thing that your kid has grown through with middle school that just like lightens up your parent's heart to go, oh, isn't this amazing? My kid has found a love for X. 
So I don't know if I would say like found a love for it, but we worked on one skill a year for middle school. So our sixth grade skill was be where you're supposed to be um, and don't lose what you're not supposed to lose. Like that was the skill, right? So like other things might have fallen apart, but th that was a skill we were going on. And then se for seventh grade, our theme was take no zeros. So we were all in distance learning and sometimes it was really hard for to care about the art teacher's project um and so i would just be like if it's paint on a paper and you get a five it's not a zero we don't take zeros i'm just trying to teach them about the grading system and how like how heavy and incomplete would be for thinking about what they would need to come away to be ready for high school and then our theme this year has been you have to talk to the adult first because um we want them to be prepared and actually by the way that cue also came from our amazing principal who has been just a wealth of amazing um like yep that's what they're gonna do <laughs> and you might want to try this and she's just been a real uh, help to our family and so um yeah we won't this year we won't talk to a, a teacher um unless the children unless they try to handle it first and then we will do backup. And so I think um, really thinking about these years as skill building, and again, that comes back to like, there's a, lots, there's a lots of opportunity to develop all three of those skills in a global majority school where the focus isn't on like, you know, telescope math and you know what I'm saying? Like kind of like some of that like high achieving stuff. So um, the fact that they can do all of those things when they go, oh, I have a missing assignment and this is the deadline, that gives me joy because that helps me feel like they're ready for the next stage developmentally. Yeah, so I would second that. Um, so, you know, Koda's a sixth grader, my daughter. Um, and so, you know, in sixth grade, they have the student portal, et cetera, so they can really start checking in the you know, where they are at in each class on their own. Um, my daughter also takes AVID, um, so they are also encouraged to check that on um, in that class as well to keep up with their assignments. Um, and then I just remember in the beginning of the school year, you know, there was like a couple handful assignments where she kind of got a lower grade than what's typical for her. And then I asked her about it and she was saying like, well, you know, she needed more time on this. She didn't really finish it, but like the teacher had already graded it. And I was like, well, why don't you, you know, talk to that teacher and like see if you can um, complete it and like continue to work on it. And she was really, really hesitant, but eventually um, went to that teacher and um, talked through it with him and um, was able to redo the assignment and complete it. Um, and ever since then, she's had a really, really good relationship with that teacher. Um, and so it was just like a, just felt like a huge um, kind of growth um, um, thing for her. Definitely the same, um, specifically because we, because for us, Franklin is a magnet school for us. And so we, you know, they take the bus and, and we don't, see their teachers we don't you know so um noah my sixth grader um had an f because he had a missing assignment and uh and so i told him that he had to do it and he said well but miss robinson is not going to grade it anymore because it's best due and i'm like i don't care <laughs> um you are still going to do this assignment even if that stays an f because you need to learn to check your portal and make sure you complete all your assignments. And so, um, so you know, with a long face, he sat behind his Chromebook and did the assignment. Um, and then a few weeks later, I see that it's not an F anymore. And I'm like, oh, well, what happens? He's like, well, I talked to Ms. Robinson and then she decided that she would grade it for me. And so it's really that like, learn, it's learning to time manage because it, it's one of the things, right? Now they have six classes with six different teachers plus advisory instead of being in the same room all day long. They have to log this three inch, three ring bind. I mean, I don't know if all middle schoolers, but like this big, huge binder, they have to log that around and then their Chromebook because it, you know. Um, and so learning to manage all your things is definitely um, the skill. I tell my kid that I wish he had a little bit more homework so that he would also learn to manage his time at home. Um, 
but when I mentioned that at the parent teacher conference, they were like, meh, but he's working so hard in school. Now. <laughs> so I don't think he's going to get a whole lot of more homework. So it's, it's been surprisingly um, not much homework. I had expected more. So that's also a pro, of course, because he is still only 11 and still likes to play. So, um, so yeah, but th I think that's, that's the skill for middle schoolers to learn. Um, Franklin is also an avid school. So um, he did put it on his electives list, but lower. So he did not get avid this year, but maybe next. Thank oh, and you. I don't know if everyone knows what AVID is, but that actually might be helpful. Um, so AVID is like, how do I explain this? Maybe you can explain it better, Reef. The way I understand it, and my kid hasn't been in it, is that it's like a, it's a college, college prep. preparation yeah. course. It's where they learn how to write summaries and how to plan your studies. And it's really, uh, it's really that. And so, um, yeah. Sonia, I saw you had a question. Do you want to ask your question? <clears throat> Thanks. Um, Suzanne, I know you shared that your son is lucky enough to be um, learning from a lot of teachers of color. Um, Heather and Reeve, I'm wondering if um, the schools where your children attend um, are also lucky enough to have uh, a lot of teachers of color. And Heather, I also, if this is an okay forum, wonder if you might just share um, a little bit about how important it is for us to be thinking about that right now, if no one objects to some information about that. So no, our, our hiring pool at Jefferson is very white, very young. Um, it is a thing that you find in many global majority schools. Um, the patterns of teachers across the district as far as like if you kind of look at the way teachers move across the district as they gain seniority not everyone and i'm not generalizing but there is a definite trend toward whiteness and wealth as teachers gain that upward mobility um, an example of that would be a school like bethune their average teacher experience is about 6.1 years and lake harriet their average years teacher experience is 23.6 so um, my children have a very young, very white teaching base and they, uh, as many amazing teachers of color were in the building at Lindale, they never had one. So my children are in their ninth year of public education and they've only ever had white teachers. Um, that does, thank you Sonia for the chance to share. Um, currently right now, um, we as a district, I know this is gonna seem really complicated. Um, we are down enrollment again, and we were down enrollment last year. And because of COVID relief funds, we didn't lay off teachers to represent the new student body size. So um, according to this year's like performa or budget, Senior Officer Giap is um, saying that we will have to lay off 135 teachers um, in order to come close to where we are in, um, in 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 uh, the student body that we now serve and so um, of our new teachers that we hire over the last five years 30 percent of our new hires have been teachers of color um, right now our district and um, our teachers union are in mediation trying to get a contract ready to go um, we do need to we do need the district and the union to create an MOA or a memorandum of agreement in order um, to protect teachers of color out of um, seniority order. So when it comes time to access or lay off teachers from a building, if I got here five years ago and you got here 4.9 years ago, I say you go. And, um, and so um, we do, just by way of numbers, I, these numbers are always in my head, in our district, if you are a black student, your ratio of black teacher to black student is 55 to 1. Your a white student to white teacher ratio is 5 to 1. And that if we we have the, the board has a goal of increasing our teacher of color, but if we lay off the very, you know, 
percentages that we just hired with accessing and we don't protect those teachers, um, we will, even if we make new hires, we won't make new gains. And that's happened over the last few years so that over the last two hiring cycles, we've only netted six teachers of color in our district. I have, I have lots more to say about that, but that's that's what I'll say for now. Yeah, and I could say for the sixth grade teaching cohort, CODA doesn't have any um, teachers of color. I do know there are a few in the upper grades, um, and then our music teacher is a uh, black teacher. Um, but it is one of the middle schools that offers, um, or the only middle school that offers ethnic studies, um, which is now a, also a high school graduation requirement, so. So we just have a few minutes left, but unless anybody else has another question, I'd love to ask one more question of, um, and again, anyone can answer this question, but um, what is one thing about your kiddos middle school that you think might be misunderstood or that you wish more people knew about your kiddos middle school like oh my gosh you have yet to meet our amazing choir teacher they're just the bomb.com right or or we have this great pool that all the kids are really excited about you know whatever whatever it might be um that you're not sure uh, or think that like maybe people don't know um so much about about the middle school we would love to hear that so one thing that i noticed um both um, at the open houses, well, actually only at the open houses because that's the only times I've actually been in the school uh, besides for parent-teacher conference, but uh, the open house just prior to summer break and then the open house just before school started, what I noticed was that a lot of students who had been at Franklin came and both the principal and assistant principal got hugs from all these kids that are now in high school. And um, the principal is an African-American woman and the assistant principal is white. And it just the fact that all these students just came to say hi to their principal and assistant principal made me feel really good that my kid was going there because which high schooler goes back to their middle school to say hi to the principal and assistant principal. I mean, that doesn't happen very often. And so I think they are a very strong team. Um, they seem to know all the kids. Um, and uh, just, yeah, I, that's what I, I'd be like, you, you need to know this because it's amazing, I think. You know, I think what I would say is um, that Jefferson, well, I don't know if many people know that Jefferson is going to be renamed Ella Baker School of Global Studies and Humanities. And so we are going to be scratching that slaveholder's name off of the front of the building, which makes me very excited. Um, the fact that we still force black students to walk into buildings named after slaveholders in this city and this is shocking to me um, but I would say what I wish that um, that people knew is like what a beautiful building it is what an amazing location it is um, what an incredible principle we have who really believes in building a teaching team that looks at their data cycles and then looks at kiddos interests and talents and creates a formula for every student in that building i wish that people knew that Je jefferson is one of the schools in the district that makes the highest growth if for students of color um, because we know that typically even in white and or privileged schools students of color don't fare better um, and so um, i wish that people knew what a dedicated um, principal can do for a building and I'll also say in all of my years of having to give feedback to a principal about a racial issue this is the first principal who was just like yep we did that yep we can do better and I'm so glad you told me and here's how I think we can use that information so the first time I was not met with fragility defensiveness crying accusing me of it um, 
we did have a black female principal the year my children started at Lindale. We ended up with a white male. It was not a great experience. Um, and it was really tough at Justice Page. Justice Page was really, in my very humble opinion, it was it was the school that was for boroughs and some of us were allowed to go there. Um, and so um, that principal was very determined to make white and or privileged parents comfortable. Uh, that's not the current principal, so I'm not speaking for Shannon, who is a black woman and I think doing amazing work there. But my experience was that um, white parent comfort was the norm that ran the halls at Page. Um, and so um, I wish that people knew that a really strong principal and leader in a global majority school is just a fantastic combination, <laughs> especially for black kids. But like Sonia says, when every when a school serves every child, a school serves every child. Um, as far as things I would like people to know about Northeast, um, there are several teachers there who have been there a long time. Um, and so I think they're committed um, to Northeast and that school. Um, they really take the time to acknowledge uh, students and, um, you know, they had an award ceremony and um, it, it was just a really beautiful thing to see them, you know, acknowledge students and for all the different um, variety of accomplishments um, uh, each student has had. Um, they also have a, a low pet program for cross country skiing and mountain biking, um, which has been a really uh, amazing outlet and, you know, opportunity to, you know, especially during a pandemic um, to get outside. Um, and also, I guess um, I would like people to know that, um, you know, there have been, you know, other kids, middle class kids um, who have um, completed schooling at Northeast have gone to Edison and have done fine. So. All right. Well, unless there's any final questions from anybody, I want to give a very warm and um, gracious thank you um, for Suzanne and Heather and Reeve for coming on, especially in the midst of all this change that is currently happening in our district right now, to still say, yes, I have some time for this, um, for uh, the elementary school Marcy to talk with, with families this evening. So thank you very much. Um, this is being recorded. And so we will share this with, with families who um, were, were unable um, to attend or perhaps would like to view this again later. So thank you very much, the three of you. We so appreciate your time and experience to share that with us. And I'm also happy if anyone wants to reach out, I'll drop my email in the chat if there's questions. I had a lot of questions I didn't want to say out loud. So if there's questions that you want to ask that you were like, I want to ask them, but I'm afraid to, I just believe that like um, white people can excavate their own biases the best by being honest about what they really are. Um, and so if that's something that you, if you are looking for a place to say and ask the things that you feel like you shouldn't, um, I've thought it, said it, done it wrong, uh, probably publicly, and I'd be happy to, um, happy to have a conversation with you about that. So just know that I'm here as a resource. Not as a teacher, but as someone who's probably made 10 mistakes I can save you from. Thank you all so much for coming. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you. Bye, guys. Thanks, everyone. Bye. Good night. Good night. Have a wonderful night. Stay well. Thank you.